Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. It was not death she feared, it was misunderstanding. This line from one of our nation's unsurpassed novels, Zora Neale Hurston's masterpiece, the 1937 published Their Eyes Were Watching God, captures what is at the heart of all great literature the irrepressible urge to speak, to express oneself, and to be heard and understood on one's own terms. I spoke with Deborah Plant, a scholar of African-American literature and the editor of Hurston's recently published Barracoon, the story of the last African cargo. Deborah is an expert in all things Hurston and has written widely and published on that author's work. When I asked Deborah about this sentence, how Janie in the eyes were watching God could fear misunderstanding more than death. Deborah gently corrected me. She was no longer afraid of death even before this pivotal scene, she said. When Janie was with Tea Cake in the book, her much younger lover, death was no longer a threat. Deborah also corrected me, again gently but firmly, when I misspoke and suggested that Hurston's novel and Hurston herself had been somewhat forgotten between 1937 when she first published The Eyes Were Watching God, and she was still a celebrated figure in the Harlem Renaissance, and the book's renewed popularity starting in the 1970s. Professor Plant explained how Hurston's training as an anthropology with Franz Boas at Barnard College shaped her writing, how important spoken African-American vernacular is to the American canon, and how best to understand this magisterial book in light of Hurston's other work. Listen to this episode which also explains how Barracoon, the recently posthumously published book by Hurston, informs our understanding of this novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. I'm really excited to welcome Deborah G. Plant today to the podcast. Deborah, thank you, first of all, for joining me on Think About It today to talk about Zora Neale Hurston. You're welcome. Uh, the pleasure is mine. So, Deb, you've written several really important books on Hurston, a biography, then an account of the philosophy and politics of Zora Neale Hurston. You've really devoted a lot of your intellectual and academic life as a writer and as a professor to Hurston. And then most recently, you published this really critically important book, Barracoon, the story of the last black cargo, which had not been published before, although Hurston wrote it a long time ago. Can you talk a little bit about your first involvement and how you got interested in Zora Neale Hurston? Well, that's a bit of a story. This happened to see her one of her books in a bookstore is how I first became aware of her. I hadn't learned of her in school. And when I first became aware of her work, I was actually in graduate school in Atlanta, Georgia, studying at Atlanta University. And she happened to see a book cover that caught my eye. And it was their eyes are watching God was the book I saw. And as I said, I had no awareness of it, but it looked, even from the cover and the title of the cover, it, it looked interesting. So I picked it up and and glanced at it. And just from the few pages that I, I looked at and the few passages that I read in the store, I knew it was a book that I needed to, to have. And so... That was the beginning of it. It's just that what I read had so enthralled me and intrigued me about this author who knew me so well. And 
I had read not a few books up to that point, but I had read none that had captured my imagination and my awe and my wonder in the way that Hurston did. And what what really what really caught my attention was what she knew about my culture. <laughs> and it was like knowing my culture she knew me. And in those days I I didn't understand what folklore was or what folk culture was or that kind of thing. But she had basically put into words the life I was living, you know, and the life of people around me and that we engaged in and practiced and that kind of thing. The dialect that she wrote in was the language I spoke. And it was the language of people around me. And so I had never seen myself in text in that way. And so I was just amazed at how she knew so much about me without knowing me personally, but it felt like she knew me personally. And so because she knew me so well, I wanted to get to know her. And that began my reading of her work and my research into her work and her life. You know, she knew me. I wanted to know her. It, it, and so, yeah. A beautiful account, and you say the awe and wonder and imagination. This is what the eyes were watching God, that it touched you in this way to give voice to your experience. And you said in this deep ways, and Zora Neale Hurston had been well known, right, in the 20s and 30s, a very well established, oh, yes. famous author. So it's kind of interesting that you had to encounter her book in a bookshop, and it wasn't on the curriculum of the university, it wasn't given to you, but it was a chance encounter with somebody who had this enormous impact as a trained social scientist, an anthropologist, a folklorist, a novelist, short story writer in the center of the Harlem Renaissance and a major anthropologist and still had been forgotten for a while? Well, I don't know that Hurston was ever forgotten. I think what's more representative is that she, the celebrity that she experienced during the Harlem Renaissance period and 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 after it because most of her books weren't published until, you know, the 30s and the 40s. So it was that she had not become a part of the established list of writers. She wasn't part of the canon. She wasn't being taught. She wasn't on anybody's syllabus. But it doesn't mean that there was no awareness of her, because there was. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was it was minimal, and we can say that. And there are all kinds of reasons that we can look at in terms of why that was so. And that's the politics of race, and the politics of sex, and the politics of class, and the politics of politics. So all of those things are a part of it. But you know, there was always someone somewhere with a copy of at least their eyes were watching God, passing it around from, you know, one member of the family to another or one student to another or one teacher to another. And this is the way that she was kept alive, mm -hmm. you know, and when, you know, making copies of her work. And, you know, the those writers who resurrected her in a major kind of way, we're talking about Mary Helen Washington and Alice Walker and, you know, People who represent, you know, feminist and womanist thought of the 70s and into the 80s, they who, by one means or another, became aware of Hurston, once they did, you know, her works were not in print, but they would share what copies they had or make copies of what they did have and share that. Mm -hmm. And so kept her memory alive in that way. 
And as they came into positions of teaching or publishing or what have you, editing, that kind of thing, then we have the renaissance of Verna Hurston, her life and her words. It's a moving story and fascinating to say there was a kind of network of people who knew her, who kept her memory alive, and that this way of continuing someone's memory through talking about it, passing on a book, is sort of in their eyes were watching God. There's so many scenes where Hurston gives us a sense of people making community through talking to each other, through telling stories and exchanging information, and that language is such a vital part, and the language she uses you said, is a language that spoke to you and resonates so strongly for people. I want to go back still to those two words you just used, the three words, the sense of awe and wonder. And there's something, I think, in the eyes of watching God when people read it for the first time, that a lot of people are struck by the vitality and kind of urgency of this book, that there's someone who wants to tell her story. Uh I wanted to ask you, Before we get back to the eyes of watching God, the other book you edited, Barracoon, which is a story of a man named Kosola, or he was then named Kucho Lewis, who was one of the last Africans brought over in the slave trade, which should have been illegal all along, but was then made illegal in the late 1850s. And then Zorin Hurston goes in 1926 to interview this man. And when she arrives, there's a very strong sense also that this is somebody who wants to impart his story to Zora Neale Hurston and to the right person to carry this story forward and to remember his story. Yes. So I was interested in this kind of urge for self-expression to tell your story. And in your book on the philosophy and politics of Zora Neale Hurston, you say she's a model of resistance and empowerment. Can you say a little bit about Farrah Kuhn and how this, this urge for one story to be remembered and to be carried forward informed that project for Hurston? Well, it's about one man's story, but then it's about the story collectively of those of us in the African diaspora. And when we look at their eyes, you know, this this is the story of Janie and she's telling her story, but it's also Hurston's story. And it's also, you know, the story of black women. And then, you know, there's the wider context in which Hurston is doing everything that she's doing. And, and what she's doing is initially she's preserving a culture or the literary forms of a culture that for anthropologists of the day, it was perceived to be vanishing or disappearing. And so these different forms of the oral tradition, song and story and sermons and proverbs and things and what have you, the idea was that they, as African Americans acculturated into mainstream society, that there would be no more of this lore that was so important in terms of the identity of black folk in America. And so Hurston is about the business of collecting every expression that she can of that history and that culture. And this was her initial impetus, you know, to preserve that folklore and to document folk life. And so this is what she's about. And as she's doing that, she she knows intuitively, she knows instinctively how important this law is. And as she's collecting it and as she's in some ways reliving it because this is also the roots of her social and cultural identity. And she realizes that this is the greatest cultural wealth on the continent. And so let us collect it. Let us present it in written form, in dramatic form. Let us share this so that others can also experience the genius of a people. 
And, and so this is the beginning of it. And, and Kosala's story is one aspect of that overall inspiration to collect and to share what human beings are about in terms of how that shows up in African-American culture. It's what she talks about in these and Men when she's saying what we have here collected in these stories, collected in these various forms of cultural expression, is that which indicates for the reader that which the Black soul lives by. And so it's getting to that part of a person, that part of a group, that part of a culture that is beyond the surface of form. That je ne sais quoi or that mystery about life that we might describe as spiritual, that we might describe as energetic, that kind of, those dimensions of humanity that you can touch by virtue of opening up to what it offers in terms of those deep qualities of our human beingness. This is what in the stories, this is what people respond to in Coppola's story, his narrative, where we understand something about the pain of black people. We understand We begin to understand something about the trauma that people who are children of the myopic experience, what that might have been like. Because his story is one of very few that we have of people who had not been born into servitude in America as you know, we see in those narratives, like those written by Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington or mm-hmm. Linda Brent slash Harriet Jacobs, people who were born into that condition. With Kosala, we have the story of someone who was forced into that condition. And we, through his eyes, we get to see what that uprooting was like, that the racination that forced acculturation and everything that went along with that. And so that trauma that he experienced, that is palpable. It's palpable. And and we get to touch that by listening to his experience through that narrative. And we get to also, just the sheer vulnerability of being a human being, not only in terms of the suffering, the loss, the grief that he carried to his grave, but also the love that he expressed, which is one of the most remarkable things you'll ever bear witness to, even, you know, in terms of what we read on a page, is that in spite of all of the suffering, in spite of the pain, in spite of one group of people attempting to objectify and dehumanize the human being, in spite of that, This man never lost his humanity. He never forgot how to love. He continued to be tender and open and kind and generous. And it tells us something about our possibilities as human beings. You know, because one has been treated in horrific ways doesn't mean that one has to become a monster, you know. Mm -hmm. Because one has been oppressed, one has been forced into you know, bondage, doesn't mean that one doesn't enjoy freedom and doesn't work for that same freedom for others. 
it doesn't mean that, you know, because one has been filled with grief for, for so many reasons, including the loss of one's mother, one's mother tongue, one's mother land, is that even with all that grief, one can still be kind and loving. And so his story gives us insight into the human soul. And Hurston had the wherewithal to write that narrative and present it in such a way that we could tap into that. That narrative could have been written in any number of ways. Mm-hmm. But it was her genius that had her write it in the way that she did so that we could not only, you know, read on the page that which the soul lives by, but actually feel it. Because as we read this story, we hear his voice. It's like, I don't know about you, but I can see him yeah. when, I, when I read that. You know, and, right, and to right. move with the rhythm of his emotions as he's talking about his experiences is like listening to a heartbeat, you know, mm. uh, feeling his pulse, uh, his lifeline. And, and, and so to be able to effect that in a rhythm work is, I, it's just utter genius, and it and it astounds me, even even now. I mean, as much as I have talked about Barracoon, any time I talk about it, I'm amazed all over again. Yeah, but it's what you're saying is that Hurston, her genius is to listen to him, to allow this voice, what you said, which nourishes the soul, to allow this to come through, and partly because she's an amazing writer and she's an amazing listener. So she becomes the witness to the story, the first witness, but then gives us an account that I think rivals the eyes of watching gods in its capacity for language to tap into this part of life, this irrepressible, indestructible part of life of grace or humanity under these terrible conditions. Well, I wouldn't describe these books as being rivals in terms of her mm-hmm. just, you know, she, in whatever form, is is allowing whatever it is that is coming through a character in a whether it's a novel or whether it's a oral narrative or whether it's a short story or, or what have you, whatever is going on for that character or that person or that informant, that is what she's genius at allowing to come through. All of this, this is her gift to us. It speaks to not only her genius as a writer, also as the social scientist that she was. And that's a part of Hurston's multifaceted talent that we are, I think, beginning to understand in relation to Barracoon is that as a social scientist, she had, and I can't find a better term to use and I might overuse it, but I, I don't know if I can even do that with Dorino Hurston, but that was just genius. Because there's no other way to explain it because even as a student of Franz Boas, even as someone who worked with Ruth Benedict and Neville Herskovitz, she worked with some of the, the best social science minds in the country. And they were pioneering at that. And so was she. And at the same time, she found her own angle of vision, her own way to do this work. and. She did things nobody taught her, <laughs> you know. This is why I say the genius is like, she didn't get that from anthropology 101. She, right, she created her own rules that worked yeah. for what she was doing. She didn't give wait for anybody else to tell her. And she did things, as you said a little bit earlier, 
what you said, she discovered or looked at the greatest cultural wealth on the continent, that she recognized that the oral traditions and the lived traditions of African Americans are an incredible treasure in this country. This wasn't necessarily taught to her at Barnard, where she went to school and studied, as you said, with Franz Boas. Although he probably said, fine, go look at this culture. Well, Boas, as I say, he was a he was a pioneering mind. And not just because, and maybe it is because, but not just because he's the, you know, father of anthropology, American anthropology. Because, you know, other anthropologists were around, but not only did he sort of establish the discipline in America and, you know, institutionalizing it initially there at, at Columbia where he was, but through his work, he found that what other anthropologists had been doing in terms of comparing one culture typically against another and setting up these hierarchies and what have you with, you know, superior cultures and lesser and all of that kind of thing. He said, that's just, that's just not only wrong headed, it's the vicious, it was racist and his work defied scientific racism. It defied racial determinism and social determinism. It, exploded the whole notion of eugenics and that kind of thing. So we can't underestimate what hmm. he introduced in terms of how social scientists would go about their work. And so these aspects of anthropology, the way he saw was the more accurate way to look at culture mm-hmm. was through the orientation of cultural relativity, wherein each culture was not to be compared with others, but if a culture was to be looked at, analyzed, assessed in terms of its own principles, its own vision, its own uh, its own internal system of what is important and how things relate to one another and that kind of thing. It is to be looked Mm -hmm. at on its own terms. And so we then began to talk about cultures relatively, not in some hierarchy. So in that whole conversation of how to begin to look at different cultures, there was not a whole lot going on with African-American culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, Boaz himself, as many anthropologists of the day, focus mainly on Native American culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of what inspired Boaz's thought was his work with the Inuit groups in Alaska. But what he had learned through his experiences is also what he taught his students and associates and what have you. And because there wasn't a lot being done in relation to African Americans, Hurston was like an ideal student who showed up. <laughs> Not only was she African American, but she was from the folk culture, wherein the, the kind of folklore collecting that you want done, these are the people you want to talk with, these are the communities you want to go into, this is where you want to get your lore and your ethnographies and things of that nature. And so she was able to provide not only that scientific expertise going into these communities, but also that inside of the view because she was one of the folk herself. And Boyas sort of, he, he talked about this to some extent in his introduction to Music Man. You know, it's like because she was one of the folk, then she could get past the kind of stonewalling that can happen when quote-unquote, outsiders try to get inside information. So because she had that advantage, and then she had her own way of collecting that data, she was able to do the kind of work with African-American folk culture, which hadn't been done. It just hadn't been done. 
And one of the reasons, and those scholars in folklore will have documented, you know, one of the reasons it hadn't been done was because it was assumed that white folks knew everything about black folks that, so that was, no. so why investigate? Why study? We already know what they think and we already know what they're like. Person's work just, you know, certainly proved that wrong. There's an aspect of what you said, the story of Kosala could have been written in different ways. So she is reproducing his way of speaking. So as you said, he was deracinated from his country. He couldn't speak in his native language anymore when he came to America, was taught English, was given another name. And then she speaks with him and captures his way of speaking, which is also quite important. So she was able to listen and reproduce this. Can you say a little bit about this, what the attitude was at this point or what she's trying to do throughout her work by capturing just the way people speak in her communities? Well, this is one of the most important aspects of not only folklore collecting, but specifically ethnographic work. As an ethnographer, you want the personality of someone to be a parent, whether a person or a group or what have you, a community. And you do that by allowing that person to speak. You're allowing your informant to speak. And you write their speech as closely as possible phonetically to represent their pronunciations and everything else about their speech, whether it's you know repetitions or whether it's so-called run-on sentences or you know syntactical kinds of idiosyncratic expressions and, and that kind of thing. You know, so you, all of this says something about your informant or the individual that that you're interviewing. And so, no ethnographer <laughs> is going to change that. Okay, yeah. that's not if you're a good one, yeah. and not if you have any integrity about your work. And Herson had, she was, you know, just superb in terms of the integrity of her work. Mm-hmm. And you know, so so this is part of her training is how to transcribe expression, how to get that down, and so. This becomes not only um, important in terms of collecting the story, but it's also important in terms of doing the ethnographic work, getting the ethnographic portrait, because the language, it authenticates, it's an authenticating feature of any kind of ethnographic work. So this is important not only in terms of the science of ethnography, but it's also important in terms of the socio-historical culture Mm -hmm. because the language he spoke in black vernacular, in Mm -hmm. this case, particular dialect of people in Alabama, particularly in uh, Plateau, Alabama. And so that dialect, like any other, what we call Atlantic Creole, whether it's Jamaican Patois or Haitian Creole or Gullah or Black English or any other name we give to that, Black English or African American vernacular expression, Ebonics, all of the names to name a particular kind of Atlantic Creole. And so what's implied in that language is everything about the history of that individual. Okay. Right. And, huh. Okay. Okay. So That's interesting. So say something more about that. How in this language is the history of where they grew up, who they grew up with? Is well let me, yeah. let me get this. So is when we look at at Kosla and one of the things I like to remind people is that when Kosala was captured, he was 19 years old. He was from a town called Bonte in West Africa. And he was of the Isha Yoruba people. 
And so we can just imagine that at 19, he knows his language, right? I mean, we learned right. language in our mother's womb. Right. And so we know that he was speaking at 19 and earlier, some form of, of Yoruba. And when Hurston interviews him, he's speaking some kind of vernacular in Alabama. What happened? Mm -hmm. What explains that? And as we begin to look into what explains that, then we get to look at the social, historical, and political dynamics that play in his life. His life and those of everybody else in Africa Town and in Alabama and anywhere else in the diaspora. What happened to us? And so with this language, we find that it has a West African grammatical structure. Mm. That never changed. You're 19, that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Okay? The words, words are the least important aspects of a language. It, you know, mm -hmm. tell us something. They're indicative. With Kosala, it tells us, okay, here is an indication that some dominating, colonizing, dehumanizing power has been involved in the history of Kosala because he's using English words from the English lexicon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that tells us something about the history of you know, a power struggle. Right. The West African grammatical structure that stays intact tells us something about the worldview of this man, which is West African. And it tells us something about the fact that even though this dominating, enslaving, dehumanizing power from Americans, particularly those who speak English, that even though their effort was to in some way silence him, in some way deny him his own self-expression, to force on him another language, which is to attempt to force on him another worldview, another relationship to himself and to the world around him. Mm -hmm. This is the violence of what that language tells us about. It tells us, it speaks about violence and it speaks about domination. Mm -hmm. But what it also speaks to is the resistance to that. Mm -hmm. It also speaks to the fact that Kosala, like anyone who speaks a vernacular language, that there is the insistence in being self-expressed. There is the insistence on being a human being because language and self-expression that language allows us is one of the most significant aspects of being a human being. And so even though there's this effort to dehumanize, there is this resistance against it, not only the resistance against it, but the insistence, insistence on being a human being. And when we look at what he uses his words to say, it also tells us about thriving as a human being and mm -hmm. celebrating life as a human being. Mm -hmm. Because not only is he letting Hurston know what had become of him and his people and his town, he is also telling her stories. He's also speaking in Proverbs. You know, he's also talking about the love of his grandchildren, whom he you know, it's, it's saving fruit for. Uh, right. Yeah, those and, teachers from the tree in the yard, right? He gives them, he hands them. <laughs> so in light of this attempt to dehumanize someone by dominating them and trying to silence mm -hmm. them, he continues to speak. When she documents his words as he gives them to her, she basically guarantees that what his message is to us, what his wisdom is to us, 
she guarantees that that we received that. Hmm. And and when I say this could have been written, his work could have been written in a number of ways. Other people had interviewed Kosala. So there are other variations of some parts of his story. But no one took the time to conduct, you know, just innumerable interviews with Kosala to gather a book length manuscript of his story. Mm-hmm. And publishers in her day were interested in her story, his story, interested in her manuscript, but they wanted her to change it. What they said, if if you if you write this in language rather than dialect, we'll publish it. <laughs> okay. But, that, and, but what you're saying is that would not have captured this deep of course. kind of residual history in the language. Exactly. Exactly, right? Because your language, your language, it's your worldview. Right. It's the worldview of the speaker. You change the language, you have someone else's worldview. Mm-hmm. And to change his language and what they meant by write it in language, we know they are saying write it in the language of the establishment, write it in what we call standard American English. Write it in the way I want to read it. Which means you don't want to hear from him. It is another way of usurping his story. Here's another way of performing historical erasure. Because now if I get you to write it in the way I want to read it, that also has you write it in a way that's comfortable to me. I don't have to be accountable for what brought this man to speak this language in the first place. Right. So you would have erased that and that you just rendered in standard English as if this whole entire history of deracination, of uprooting somebody, would have also erased his capacity to have his own worldview, to have his own experience. And by keeping his language, Hurston kept his worldview and say he has his own way of making sense of his circumstances, his world on his own terms rather than the terms imposed on him. Yes, literally on his own terms. Yes. One of your books on Hurston, Every Top Must Sit on Its Own Bottom, The Philosophy and Politics, where I said earlier, you said it's a model of resistance and empowerment. And then you say, it's not a straightforward, simple, easy process for Hurston. So it wasn't just she had a voice, she used it, but that as a black woman, she had to use a lot of different modes to get her experience across. And what I found so interesting, what you just said about how she basically found a way to allow Kosala to speak about his experience on his own terms. It seems also be something that you sort of identify in her work overall, which is a political and a philosophical question to say, how do you express yourself on your own terms in a world which doesn't really, as you said, people didn't want to publish the book initially. It took, I don't know, what, almost 90 years for you to publish it, right? Uh, Harper Collins published. Right. Oh, uh, Harper Collins. You did, you did a lot of work in Harper Collins and took it up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. If we think about the book that most people probably get introduced to, Hurston today is The Eyes Were Watching God, which is also, I think, a way to insist that Janie, she has her own language. It's never okay. taken from her, but she has to insist that people will hear it as her own language. It's not that she comes into her own language. She had it from the beginning, but that people are not paying attention or are trying to make us not say things in the way she wants to say them. Yes. I'm, I'm listening for your, your question. My question is, 
there's Hurston as the interviewer of Kosola, who then creates this book with him, really, as a co-author. In The Eyes of Watching God, it's Hurston, and the material is also Hurston, probably her life, the people around her, she knew, and her imagination, to then give rise to this character, Jamie, who becomes as alive as anybody. I mean, she's so alive on the page. You read her, you it is it's palpable, and of her her urgent sense of being alive on her terms and making you understand that. And so I'm interested in this, how you see her, what you just described, which was just incredibly powerful, how you described how Hurston as a social scientist recognized and understood the incredible treasure of spoken language of black vernacular, how he described that as holding a knowledge and a worldview that otherwise couldn't be accessed. And then she writes a novel where she also creates this. What I'm trying to get to, I'm interested in the, the relation between Hurston, which is probably, I'm making too much of a distinction, the social scientist and Hurston, the novelist. I'm not quite clear about your question, but I'm, I feel some parts of it. So I'm going to respond to that. Okay. And then you can okay, uh, no, great. Yeah. ask questions as we go along. And so I can get to what you're trying to get to. But, you know, the, the question of language, yeah, you're right. It's in their eyes of watching God as well. It's just different, different agents, different speakers, different situations. With their eyes of watching God, we, again, like with Garakun, we have a question of, you know, whether someone can even speak, right? Jane mm-hmm. is not allowed to speak when she wants to. And she's not allowed to speak how she wants to. Jody is the big voice. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the, as they say, you know, the, the, he's the one who commands everybody. And he's the wind and everybody else is the grass. And he, ha- he has a ruling chair in his pants. And so it's like he's a dominating figure. And it's like when he thinks that, you know, what people are saying, and we're specifically talking about you know, communication, if he's okay with it, you know, then it's great. When he has an attitude about it, he wants everybody to be quiet or he belittles them and, you know, degrades them. And when it comes to his wife, Jane, well, then it's a politics of sex. It's like women are supposed to, like children, be seen and not heard. Unless, you know, you're communicating to some benefit of the male who is behaving like your master, Mm -hmm. uh, in quotation marks. And so this business of domination and subordination is, you know, when it comes to men and women, it's not different from domination of one group by another, domination Mm -hmm of uh, plant owners by people who've been in bondage on those plantations. And, and, and you know, the, the, the idea of domination by anyone who considers, you know, something called white supremacy to be real. Mm-hmm. So, so we have these same dynamics, these different players. But domination is domination. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing pants or overalls mm-hmm. or a dress or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So... So Janie comes up against this, both with Logan, uh, Logan Tillich, her first husband, who, you know, tells her what her place is and when to, you know, she can't talk back. You know, don't change too many words with me. He, you know, he's going to let her know. You don't get to do that. Right. Uh, right? You respect my, how she put it, uh, exaggerated masculinity, you know, right. there, there's this idea that being a man gives you these privileges to dominate even other men, but specifically women. And when it comes to Jody Stark, women chilling chickens and cows, right? So, right. 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 So she has to deal with that with Logan Killers and we know what she does with him. She leaves him. And then, you know, she meets someone who, as he said, he intends to be a big voice, and that's supposed to be how she finds her identity through him. If I'm a big voice, that makes a big woman out of you. 
And that's how you arrive at your sense of self-worth through me. You know, so here's another erasure. It's like you, your existence, even, you know, the quality of it depends on your relationship with me. Right. And that depends on my standing in the world and I'm making one. And so in the process, he tells her when she can speak, you know, one of the salesmen want her to give a little speech when they have their social event. And he says, my wife don't know nothing about no speech making. I didn't marry her for that. Her place mm-hmm. is in the home. Right. And so he shuts her down at every turn. She mm-hmm. wants to communicate. She wants to be in communion with the people of the town. He says, you have a position and you need to mind your class. You are above these people. Why would you want to associate with low class people? So he isolates her, not only physically, because he keeps her either in the, in the kitchen or in the store, but also linguistically. She can't mm-hmm. join in the storytelling. He doesn't right. even want her around to listen to it. And the whole business of language becomes really one of a power play between the two of them. Because as you were, I know you read this book many times, so you know well that, you know, when they get to signify, yeah. when, they, when they get to that juncture, because that's how things evolve into this, you know, tension between the two of them. Right. And, you know, and she says what she says, because, you know, he's saying to her, you're not some young woman, you know, which is your rump hanging to your knees. And then she, you know, one ups him with, what she says about his looking like the change of life when he pulls the princess down. And <laughs> that that allows her some space. She she gets slapped for that because now there are no words anymore. He can't do he can't any further dominate her linguistically. So right. he gets to do so physically. So you know what transpires after that. And then she she has to deal with the same kind of thing. Uh with tea cake, it's more subtle because there's more more other kinds of communication between the two of them. It's not all the one who dominates and the one who's been victimized. They have more of a balanced relationship, but not really. <laughs> you know, right. and, and so he still finds herself in a situation of being dominated and resisting that domination. But we see it clearly, very clearly, when it comes to Joe Starks and we're talking about language and the importance of it and how we use language to resist domination as well as to, to dominate people. So I'm not sure if I've got to your question. Certainly, and it's, it's that linguistic domination is as destructive and terrible and what Hurston is doing to say this Janie needs to speak for herself and she won't be in the first marriage she's just relegated to the kitchen in the second marriage she's put on a pedestal but removed from community silenced so the book is about her speaking the whole time the whole book is her telling her friend phoebe what happened to her so the book is enacts the sense that there's this irrepressible urge to speak which when we talked earlier you connected in kosala it's both to retain the grief and the suffering and the will to live and the the energy and the spiritual dimension of life. So language contains both of those things. Yeah. And there's this moment in much later in the book, as you know, where there's a, a trial and there's a terrible thing that happened and you know and then she's put on trial and I was just struck in the sentence that stuck with me for such a long time when there's a jury and she's the Chinese on this terrible predicament about something she couldn't have helped. And then it says, it was not death she feared, it was misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Which to me, it struck me so much that someone could fear misunderstanding more than death itself. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, because, you know, Jamie wasn't ever really afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, (laughs) Maybe that's why she's such an amazing character in, in world literature, right? You know, when TK's saying, I bet you're sorry you married me, I brought you down here on the muck, and we're in the middle of this raging storm. And she says, you know, that TK was her husband, and 
they were married and, and if she died in that storm, mm-hmm. says, everybody has a time to die, right? And then he says, but because of him, don't remember the exact words, but somebody to say that she was able to see the light of day. She had lived life right. in a certain way with a certain quality that she hadn't had the experience of before him. And so she would die a happy woman. And, and so she wasn't she wasn't trying to run from death. She wasn't afraid of death. And so, yeah, but to be misunderstood, you know, and any time I say that, I, I hear Nina Simone, right? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Please don't let me be misunderstood. <laughs> because sometimes it doesn't matter what you say if somebody doesn't understand your heart and your mind, it doesn't matter what you say. So sometimes right. words can't help us. And when we can't articulate what is sold for us, and in this case she's talking about what was sold for her and TJ, when she she's going like, how these twelve White man on the jury, how are they going to understand anything about him and me? They don't know about us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They pass judgment because they do, and they pass judgment in her favor. But even then, they don't really understand right. them. Right? And you're right. This question of understanding is very important for individuals as well as for communities of people of color. And it sort of happens not infrequently in courtroom scenes. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you had a chance to look at Jonas Gordon, but when John Pearson has to mm-hmm. go to court, you know, he doesn't say anything. Mm-hmm. A lot of times critics will read Janie not giving, you know, some first person speech about things. They said, well, but she herself is not speaking. Well, John Pearson didn't speak either. Nobody talks about that. But in any case, <laughs> you know, he doesn't speak either. He says, it doesn't matter. He tells his friend Hamble, it doesn't matter what we say. They think they already know about us anyway. Right. Okay. And this takes us actually back to the folklore. Why? Because yeah. that's folklore. We don't need to, un- we already know everything we need to know about these people. Well, the amazing thing, what you said about Hurston saying, this is the great cultural wealth of this country, but white people thought, we know this already, but they knew nothing. So right. Hurston, when you're saying in this courtroom scene, she doesn't really address the 12 men on the jury. She addresses, I think, also all of her readers now and all of America and saying, this is this book. This is what I experienced on my own terms. Janie speaking for her, for the African-American experience. And this power of language to not be reduced to just a legally valid testimony, something that people can understand on their terms. Right. But to break through and to say this is opening up another way of speaking, yes. which has always been there. But I think this is the important part. It's always been there. Kosala has been speaking. Cheney. Black women have been speaking, but people just wanted to pretend they couldn't hear. Or as you said, the two husbands, the three husbands really all say, don't really speak on your own terms, speak on my terms. That's right. That's right. You know, that's an excellent observation that you make. You know, unless it's articulated in this first-person testimony kind of thing, if it takes a certain form, we'll listen to it. Right. Okay. Right. If it takes a certain form, we'll listen to it. Which basically means that if it doesn't, we're not listening to it and we're not interested in you. Mm-hmm. And when you're not interested in the person, you effectively erase them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Render them invisible. And you see, as human beings, we are gregarious. We are social creatures. That hurts us. Right. We, so that hurts us. But you wouldn't know that because you can't see me anyway. You can't right. even you can't even find room within yourself, within your own consciousness, to even make the effort to understand. Right. And what you just said, it's a different understanding. It's not just I get it because I already know who you are, but rather to open yourself up and say you are a separate independent person who has her way of seeing herself in the world. And I think this is 
what turns, and this is what's so amazing about the end of the Eisler Watching God, where it's devastating in a certain way, but we don't walk away totally devastated. We actually, there's an empowering voice at the end. Jamie gives us a story. Yes. Yes. And she gives us a story. She gives us possibility. <laughs> you know. Right, right. She gives us hope. She gives us inspiration. You know, one of the things that she says about Nanny is that she took something as as big and wide as the horizon. Mm-hmm. And she it down into a little something. <laughs> and you know, which just suffocated vitality and wonder in life. And so her story, you, when Phoebe says, you, you make me feel, you know, I don't know, 10 feet tall or whatever, and I'm going to make Sam take me fishing. And she's got another idea about how to how to live, how to be alive in her living. Right. You know, not just marking time, you know, and this is what right. she says to TK when there in that storm, he just said, before you, I was, I was just, I was just living between my head and my heels. I was just marking time. I was, she wasn't really alive. And sharing the story, it's, it's a woman's story. It's a black woman's story. And it's also, it's a story of human beings who want to live actually live in the world, you know, right. and that requires freedom, right? You know, this is one of the things that she talks about after Jody's death and, you know, Phoebe is saying, well, people are saying that you're not in mourning longer. You need to be mourning right. Joe more. And she says, you know, she wasn't, first of all, mourning shouldn't last any longer than one is grieving and she's not grieving. She says, and they want her to get married, you know, to some right. at some other town. But she says, I am enjoying this freedom too much. And Phoebe says, don't let them hear you say that. Right. It's freedom. You see, yeah. this is also part of the story that Jamie leaves with us. It's this urge to be free. It's beautiful in a way. I think when we're left with that and then Phoebe says, I'm going to go and tell my husband to go fishing at midnight this freedom to do, to actually live life and to be reminded that our outer life, that Jamie reminds us, we may not be living it. We may be marking time and she's gone through so much grief and yet she's really alive. And she says, I'm going to wrap the horizon around me. There's so much mm-hmm. life here. And I think it tells you two things that Jamie lived her life, but what you said, that potential or possibility, you said possibility, right? That the book opens up a possibility. Yeah. Yes, you know, because slavery comes in so many forms, right? There's this thing that, you know, they call child slavery, and patriarchy is another form of slavery, and we get a good sense of that, and there I be watching God. Uh, But being a slave to social convention is another form of slavery, Mm -hmm. right? And conventional outlook, what is the status quo, and how do we acquire that, and how do we maintain that? And this is why she's so disgruntled with, her grandmother. She's all like, that was not what I had in mind. You know. Right. And then she spends all of these years with Jody living out this vision that her, her grandmother had for her. And you know, and, and when Jane is interested in love, love is an adventure too, just like going to the horizon. I mean, but the grandmother says that's you know, that's a very prong we, we colored women get hung on and, and causes us so much trouble. But if your idea of love is marriage, you you know, uh, is that really what you're you're going to find it? And we know that that's not the case because Janie said so. She says she was married to Logan, and she learned after a few months that marriage did not make love. Right. Just because you were married doesn't mean you were with someone who loves you and, and whom you love. But the convention of it is what people were after. And when it comes to Jane and Jody, not only the convention of marriage, but also that convention of a middle-class lifestyle and what that means and what you should do and 
what determines what you think and feel about yourself and what you do is some kind of external authority. And then, you know, the society around you, the community around you becomes that Greek chorus that comments on everything you say, and then you're afraid right. to do it. Right. right. And so Jane is saying when she's in the muck with tea cake and they're listening to the Bahamian drummers and all and they're doing uh, green shouts and, and fire dances. She said, if the people in Edenville could see me now, they will <laughs> wonder what the world happened to me. Because, you know, she's supposed to be sitting high and looking low. Um, <laughs> right. That's the convention of her particular status in life, right? So her social status. But we can become, it doesn't matter what part of the social status that you're on, whether the so-called lower end or upper end, everybody's moving according to some predetermined convention about what your place is, where it is, how you fit in it, what right. you should be saying in relation to that, what language you use even, all of these kind of things. And to the extent that we live according to those dictates, we're enslaved as well. Here's another kind of slavery. And Jane Curry says, hey, free yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Deborah, this is, uh, <laughs> I wish we could go on for a long time. This has been one of the greatest conversations I've had about literature, to link it to this call to free yourself by finding a way to live your life on your own terms and express it. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I want to thank you for all of the work you've done on Zora Neale Horson, the books you've written, plus editing now this recent book, Barracoon. But I want to thank you mostly for actually really talking to me about what this book means to you and then what it can mean to other people. It's intellectually illuminating and it's moving. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was the question, what it means to me and what it what it means to other people? Was that yeah. the question? Yeah. yeah. You've asked that much more than any question I could have asked. <laughs> I feel I have a far deeper understanding of both those books than I had before. That's really, I'm really grateful to you. Oh, well, then thank you for that. And yeah, it's, you know, what you're talking about, what you have there, you have two examples of Hurston's genius. We know her as a writer and, you know, there as a watching God is, just a superb example of Zora Neale Hurston as, as a writer, as a novelist. And then you have Barracoon, and so now we know her as a social scientist of genius. And so we have these two works of genius, you know. And one other thing that I'd like to remind people is that although we're just getting Barracoon, Barracoon is Hurston's first book work. Yeah. She wrote this before she wrote any other book. Mm -hmm. This is her first book, even though only now published. And this first book is a book of social science significance, right? It's an anthropological work. It's not fiction. And so we have a, a stellar example of her fiction with their eyes and, you know, just a wonderful, brilliant example of her social science genius with Barakun. Right. Well, Deborah, I want to thank you for um, joining me on the podcast and for connecting these two very different works, Barakun and the Eyes Are Watching God. And I hope to have you on another podcast at some point about some other books that you care about. Well, you know, that would be my pleasure. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And yeah, I just there's just so much to explore about both of them, but I hope that this conversation has been useful in terms of looking at some things that you want your listeners to be privy to. So I hope this supported that. This was fantastic. So I want to thank you again, because this was my conversation with Deborah Plant, who's one of the major leading scholars on Zora Neale Hurston, has recently published a book called Barracoon, the story of the last African cargo, and widely published on Zora Neale Hurston. So thank you, Deborah, and I hope to speak to you soon. All right, Lily. You're very welcome, and I hope we do speak again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.